fulfilled if you can determine some honest and simple order of existence following those trodden ways of wisdom, which are pleasantness and seeking her quiet and withdrawn paths, which are peace, then and so sanctifying wealth into commonwealth, all your art, your literature, your daily labors, your domestic affection and citizens duty will join and increase into one magnificent harmony. You will know then how to build well enough. You will build with stone well, but with fresh better. Temples are made with hands, but riveted by hearts, and that kind of marble custom vein is indeed eternal. John Ruskin. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone to Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, hosted by the Stella Moving Center every Saturday, so that we can really get some in-depth look at what the various religions, philosophies, and um, spiritual traditions of the world have to tell us about the human endeavor. This year in particular, we're looking at the concept of citizens of the future. And it seems to me that um, citizens of the future will learn from the past and from their past. And something about that has to do with their soul education. Today, we are taking up this topic of soul education with Dr. Jim Tepfer, and he is a very uh, beginning <laughs> supporter uh, right from the get-go of this Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, as well as having been a student uh, of theosophy for many, many years. Um, in this regard, I am so grateful to him for being the superintendent of theosophy school, which our children attended, and which helped me to learn a lot about the value of storytelling, amongst many other things, uh, for soul education. So, Jim, I give it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, uh, Renee. Uh, as Renee uh, mentioned, I'll be looking at soul education from a, broadly speaking, a theosophical perspective. Um, and just in terms of that perspective, I'll just mention a few uh, general concepts. Um, principally, the theosophical or the wisdom teachings of theosophy point to the fact that the divine is within as well as without both man and nature, that every human soul is on a vast pilgrimage over vast eons of time to realize the fullness of the divinity. And that requires then a, an evolution under law, which we call karma, which many people in traditions call karma. And furthermore, that um, this also requires necess necessarily innumerable rebirths before the individual has been able to ascend the ladder of becoming and, and reaching full enlightenment. There are numerous individuals, uh, even some of whom we know in history, who have achieved this plateau of self-illumination, of cosmic uh, fullness. And those, for example, in the East, we can refer to the divine Krishna, to the Buddha, to Shankaracharya. In the West, we can think of Pythagoras, Plato, the wonderful Plato, the heavenly Plato is one uh, uh, academic referred to him as the heavenly Plato, uh, the divine Plato, and then also to Christ. Uh, Christ is a remarkable individual, a luminous individual, full of light and loveness, of love, a bit of light and love and wisdom. Um, so these are just examples of the fact that this, that individuals have achieved the fullness of soul education, but furthermore, they come into the world in order to make us aware that we have exactly the same potential uh, to realize the fullness of the divinity within us, which is also without us. Now, having said that, uh, what was I going to do? Because this is just a kind of umbrella perspective. I'm not going to go to any technical concepts in theosophy at all, uh, or only just very, very minimally. Um, but when Renee brought to me the question of, Jim, would you speak on soul education? My response inwardly was dual. It was, wow, what? 
Uh, meaning, <laughs> it's thrilling, but on the other hand, what could it mean? Um, and so what I decided to do was kind of engage a little bit in what Emerson called man thinking. That is, I just made myself sit down and think in the simplest possible terms what soul education can be within a certain general spiritual framework um, and how it contrasts with modern education. Um, and so the more I thought about it and kind of sifted through things and simplified things and simplified things further, uh, the more I came up with a presentation, which I think uh, made sense that as I understood it, and hopefully you'll understand it as well. And it doesn't matter because after 15 to 20 minutes, because I'm going to read what I have to say, what I thought out carefully, but then we can kind of form a, what I like to call an instant sangha, an instant community, an instant academy in which we ourselves engage in thinking out loud together. Because um, I like that, uh, that notion of thinking out loud together. So now you're going to hear me thinking out loud in solitude, uh, based on what my what occurred to me, a kind of line of thinking, a thread of thinking. And so you know, for the next few minutes, I'm going to share that with you. Fiat Lux is imprinted on the seal of the University of California. It means, let there be light. Summoning that light is the overarching purpose of both spiritual and secular education. Education, then, is about the pursuit of truth. It is also about the transmission of discovered truth that we call knowledge from one generation to another. That knowledge is transmitted from teacher to student in a variety of modes. Modern secular education primarily transmits knowledge through intellectual means, through rational analysis, through logic, through controlled experimentation, and through the memorization of facts. Modern education is all about the mind. It is about intellectual development within the mind. It is not concerned with cultivating emotional maturity or distinguishing between wholesome and harmful desires or about training the moral will to do what is right and good. Thus, we find that the modern education, edu educated person is highly informed and skilled in reasoning within the compass of a specialized field of knowledge. However, the quality of his personhood his character and his ability to creatively contribute to the uplift of his communities is sadly lacking unless he has it innately. Is it any wonder then that we witness successive generations of brilliant, technologically savvy youths who are nonetheless culturally adrift, weak-willed, and in search of a deeper purpose in life, one beyond mere success, social status, or the accumulation of wealth? Soul education, by contrast, plumbs the depth of fiat lux and claims that its real meaning is let there be wisdom. Wisdom is all-inclusive and includes the profoundest possible insights into a right relationship with God, nature, and man. Like light, wisdom is not only illuminating, but warm energizing, and compassionate. If this is true, then soul education is potentially far more existentially enriching and socially transformative than modern secular education can ever be. Wisdom is purest insight into the good in any and every situation. It is knowing what to say, when to say it, to whom to say it, and how to say it. Wisdom alchemizes and transforms every relationship. At its very core, soul education, like wisdom, is holistic. It involves enlightening the whole person. It involves uplifting the whole of society, too. It leaves nothing out of its learning equation. If so, then soul education necessarily involves training and integrating the head, the heart, and the hand. It involves clarifying our thinking, awakening our intuitions, and harvesting the lessons embedded in our experiences. In a word, 
soul education shifts the focus as well as the locus of knowledge from the mind in an intellectual sense in isolation to the all-inclusive soul. What does this mean? What is the soul? The soul is a metaphysical unit. It is, if you will, a ray of God's mind. As Ralph Waldo Emerson states, I am born into the great, the universal mind. As a ray of God's mind, the human soul is necessarily immortal, luminous, and self-moving. It is the heart center and source of infinite possible insights into God, nature, and man. It is fundamentally a unifying influence. It is the source of man and nature of creativity, preservation, and self-regeneration. Furthermore, the immortal soul is both transcendent and immanent. Now, this is important, and it's an enigma. It is transcendent because the soul is not confined by space-time, by the brain-mind, or by ordinary consciousness. Yet, the immortal soul is simultaneously immanent or present in space-time, in the brain-mind, and in ordinary consciousness. Its vitalizing presence in the mind is what allows us to aspire to its full, exalted condition of wisdom and omniscience. In a sense, this is what education is about, about turning the soul toward the divine. So, soul education necessarily encourages aspiration. It encourages upward mental movement. It nurtures ideals which unify and heals one's mind and one's culture. It is concerned with ascent in order to gain spiritual altitude and an encompassing perspective on life. Furthermore, soul learning is not limited to any particular stage of life. It includes our sunset years as well as the halcyon days of early childhood. It is not confined to a particular location such as the classroom. Indeed, it can and does occur at home, at church, at work, at play, in the theater, and in all the informal social context of life. Furthermore, even at school, soul learning can take place not only in the classroom, but under the protective canopy of trees and sparse zen-like gardens or next to quietly flowing rivers. Finally, Soul learning occurs in treasured moments of serene solitude when we meditate on universal ideas in silence. Soul education is thus the golden thread of lifelong learning and is multidimensional. From this perspective, society is a school for the practice of human virtues. Nature is a laboratory for the discovery of God's designing intelligence. And the Godhead itself is the highest object of meditation for the mind's transformation into an awareness of its own immortality and the reality of brotherhood. All three of these schools of life are in perpetual session. As the Chinese sage Lao Tzu taught, soul education is about subtraction as well as about addition. What does that mean? We begin in spiritual ignorance, but we can, through effort and building on our failures, end in realized wisdom. To realize our innate wisdom, we must first unlearn. We must consciously cure the mind of its maladies, its misconceptions, its misperceptions, its romanticized illusions, its self-destructive habits, and its false values. This cleaning up and clearing up of the mind through letting go of our attachments and prejudices creates mental spaces for the light of wisdom to illuminate. We might say that this purification of the mind, our unlearning, is painful, but necessary for spiritual, intellectual, and moral growth to occur. You know, when you think of an example, of someone who goes to learn something, if they really are serious about it, and they go to someone who's very gifted and skilled in it, one of the first things they have to do is assess the student and see all the bad habits the student has, all the attitudinal problems that the student has, 
to see what it has to help the student unlearn, divest himself or herself of before they're really ready to do anything that's genuinely going to help them progress. We hear this a lot of, in, in the wonderful Zen tales of, of, of Zen masters. When a student comes, the more promising the student looks, the more the Zen master is uh, uh, determined to make the student do anything but study the philosophy of Zen or, or understand the concepts of Zen. He makes them do all kinds of work of various kinds until he's managed to work through his frustration and is humble enough now to really come, not with the idea that he's going to be brilliant and wise, but that he's actually going to be a learner. So unlearning is critical to the idea of being able to make the mind really receptive to the light of the soul. So learning recognizes that to the budding mind of the child, the world has just begun. The universe has just been freshly created to the young learner. Everything is virginal, touched with originality, and all intellectual discovery is an epiphany. Likewise, to the genuine adult seeker, the world of knowledge is forever new. It is never settled. And this is eminently true of the spiritual knowledge and wisdom which have infinite depths. As we have seen, modern education is focused almost exclusively on intellectual development. Furthermore, it is based on the false theory that the mind is a blank slate on which God, nature, and society write their respective scripts and which we unconsciously act out. Modern education does not embrace the theory of innate ideas, uh, such as we find in Plato, or of innate wisdom, which is pointed to by almost every spiritual teacher. Its stimulus for growth is unfortunately based on com competition between students, and its educational success is measured by grades and test scores. Ultimately, the competitive urge and the anxiety-driven fixation on grades are corrosives to the indwelling spirit. Modern education, sad to say, disconnects the pursuit of knowledge from the intelligent embodiment of moral values, which could conceivably uplift and regenerate society. Soul education, as we've seen, is concerned with the whole person and not just with the development of intellectual powers. It holds to the notion that there is innate knowledge and that compassion is the irreducible motor of life at its best. For that reason, soul education is equally concerned with the progressive realization of universal responsibility as it is with critical analysis. Soul education naturally places great value on cooperation and collaboration. It is committed to nurturing kindness, brotherliness, mercy, and moral heroism. Intellectually speaking, soul education emphasizes questions over answers. This is very Socratic. So Socrates was concerned with people generating an inner dialogue, with having tremendous confidence in themselves as beings who have innate knowledge, which they have to wake up, which they have to do so by raising questions which challenges them, such that they move out of their lethargy and their sleepwalking and begin to examine the wonder world of ideas, to use King's, uh, Martin Luther King's beautiful phrase. Um, so raising questions is a signature of the spiritual intelligence. There's never an end to the richness of a revel and the revelatory power of a question. Questions, when asked correctly and properly, contain their own answer or the seed to their own answer. That is a very interesting paradox about good questions. The more we raise them, the more they germinate within us the possibility of self-discovery and of discovery of wisdom and true fundamental knowledge. Soul education emphasizes critical thinking over mere memorization. How sad that children have to go through this and can't, aren't allowed to think uh, at all until you get to college, if lucky, or if you're fortunate and have some good high school teachers, you might. Soul education cultivates imagination as well as reason. How fortunate those children 
who get exposed to teachers in the third, fourth, and fifth grade who are not compelled to meet to get them involved in mechanical education and hold before their mind's eye and their soul the notion of great achievements by remarkable people of all cultures or great mythic heroes who appeal to the virginal imagination, which is supple and also expansive and awakens and resonates to the heart of a child or a young person who loves heroism, who loves the good, the true, and the beautiful, if they ever had a chance to express it, to celebrate it, to hear about it, to have it emphasized. So soul education trains the creative will as well as disciplines the intellect. It is open to the teaching power of dream as well as to the compelling conclusions of logic. Like Shakespeare, soul education is open to learning not only from books, but from brooks and stones and from little children and sages too. Furthermore, soul education is patient, withholding contradictory views because it has faith in the synthesizing power of pure insight. Finally, soul education includes self-study as well as the study of texts. Self-knowledge is ultimately the key to wisdom and is superior to any book knowledge, including religious text. If all this is true, then what might be involved in reforming modern education and making it more susceptible to soul learning and the quest for divine wisdom? Well, many ways of, of responding to that question. Um, my heavens, there's a bizarre ways, but what is needed, perhaps, is a recovery of what is often lost in the early years of education, namely love, trust, and reverence. All three qualities, or states of mind, point to the need to cultivate the alpha heart instead of the current overemphasis on the alpha intellect. To love learning is essential. To sustain and renew learning is possible when one increasingly appreciates the knowledge of one's teachers and of those who dedicate their lives to using that knowledge in the service of others. Trust is likewise pivotal. How can one learn if one does not trust one's teachers, which includes parents, friends, and even strangers? How can one learn if one does not trust oneself as a learner? And finally, how can one learn the deepest knowledge if one does not possess reverence? We should revere not only God, but man. Not only man, but nature. Why? Because God is everywhere, both inside and outside of man and nature. If the divine is omnipresent, then all learning of whatever kind is sacred, is consecrated. We begin to learn when we revere teachers and extend that reverence to all those who, as Pythagoras said, are full of goodness and light. Okay, so now you have some very preliminary thoughts. Um, <laughs> um, so I hope it made some sense, my friends. <laughs> I like to think of us, you know, a little, little community of looking at something or voicing your own thoughts and ruminations on this. Certainly welcome. Jim, I'd like to uh, ask a question to... Uh... The uh, celebration of the Abrahamic uh, tradition, of, uh, which occur approximately the same time of the year uh, this year, and uh, the influence on theosophy by these three traditions, the, the religions of Abraham. J Judaism as well, correct? Uh, yeah, and Christianity. <laughs> From the standpoint of someone uh, from a theosophical perspective, uh, the core of every religious tradition, really, if you examine it carefully and with a, a Gandhi said, with a, with a pure heart, um, you will find that at the core, pulsating like a heart at the core of all major religions, is that which is quintessentially human in the very best sense of the term. It appeals to the divine the, hum the divine in humanity, 
it's going to appeal to and attempt to draw out by making it aware of the invisible world uh, 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 as, a, as a, a, a spiritual world that can infuse the mind and heart of man such that he or she experiences and is able to help uplift the world. I remember once, there were, I mentioned this before in other contexts, the, uh, uh, Bill Muir, I think, uh, once had a gather together scholars from different religious traditions, a Buddhist, a Hindu, uh, uh, someone from Judaism, someone from Islam, um, and perhaps one of the Catholic. Um, and he had them all come together and say, okay, these themes I want you to discuss over a period of weeks. And you meet once a week for three hours, and you explore these themes, and you articulate them in the clearest possible language from the standpoint of your own particular tradition. And they chose themes that touched upon all of the traditions. And what evolved over time was really quite remarkable and beautiful. Because as time went by, and they be heard someone articulate a particular way of looking at a theme, and then heard the other traditions reporting on that, they both found common ground, and they also found things that were very beautiful. But they said, well, we, that's not the way we express it, but if someone were to express that interpretation, I would welcome it. It's something we ought to include in our religion, as, as, as people who think about things, who people who understand and explore the concepts of religion. So what they found by the end of like seven weeks, uh, when a theme was being discussed, someone would say, now, I know from your tradition, you approach it this way, and that's very, very interesting. And from your tradition, I understand you approach it this way, because they took time to start studying each other's traditions, is what happened. They became so interested in what each other were saying, that in time, they began to educate themselves on the other traditions. And so by the time they were having kind of a love fest, a kind of intellectual and spiritual love fest, because they were enjoying each other so much and enjoying learning about the tradition, all the fears and all the, all the other stuff kind of separated out. It became dissipated. It became when they came together, they created a kind of magical orbit. And in that magical orbit, they suspended their particular traditions enough to be able to have an opening for something coming in. But language aside, touch something similar, something common to all of them. And that's why you find the theosophical teaching that really all great teachers come from the same and divine source. And the wisdom is going to have to be similar or the same for it to be wisdom. And so every teacher embodies living wisdom that's appropriate to a particular context to a particular people. In fact, it's very interesting in Islam. In Islam, one of the points is, Look, God has sent messengers to the world for a long, long time. It's just that Muhammad is the last and the greatest of the prophets. That's the problem from another point of view. But what they're saying is, look, if you were a Buddhist and you are true to Buddhism, that's perfectly fine. Allah will still welcome you into the heavens because that was your teacher at that time. So there's more universality in the depths of Islam than is often recognized. So if, if you're a Sufi mystic in particular, you're open to all kinds of teachings. Um, and that's one of the great traditions of the Sufi mystics in Islam. Um, and it tends to bridge other traditions as well. Anyway, those are some thoughts. Well, thoughts only. May I ask a question, uh, Jim? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Actually, I have I have two questions. But the first one is, what was the quote that you said at the end? The only quote I used in the in the short presentation was actually from Emerson, uh, from his essay on the Oversoul, which is quite remarkable. Uh, it is so it's so wisdom oriented. It's so wisdom religion oriented. It's just it's just it's elastic. Uh, it, it's it's uh, the supple. And it's so much the mind being absorbed in the divine. That's what he says about entering into to, 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 to the universe, into the, to the universal mind. Um, that um, so it's from he says, I, the imperfect, worship my my 
my perfect, the oversoul. Um, and he mm -hmm. says, you come into your fullness when you do this. There was an interesting physicist. Um, he was in mathematics originally, and his mathematics was so powerful and so original that he realized only three people in the whole globe understood what he was saying. So he went from went from went from mathematics to physics. Um, but at any rate, one of the things he concluded in his life as a physicist, he said, "There's got to be a cosmic mind, and then there's the human there's the human mind intelligence, and then there's atomic intelligence." And he got that out of just studying quantum physics and physics in general. And people accused him of being religious. He said, if I'm religious, I'm just religious in the Einsteinian sense that I believe the universe is a vast mystery full of intelligence and that therefore, you know, mirroring a cosmic mind is what human beings are trying to do when they study science. They're trying to understand the mind of nature and they're trying to do it through using their own mind, which is an aspect of the cosmic mind. And he had nothing to do with religion as such. It's very interesting. So that was the first question. Was it just a quote from Emerson? Thank so you. What was the second question? The second question is um, taking your um, rarefied and beautiful presentation to a practical level of, um, I received a call the other day from a friend on the mainland. Uh -huh. And she was in great distress because um, her mother had passed and um, uh, her mother was the glue that held their family together. And the family at this point was a brother and a sister. The brother she was very simpatico with. The sister had always been mm, chilly, slightly chilly, polite, but slightly chilly to her you know, throughout their lifetime. And no matter what overture she made, um, her sister was always at an arm's distance and cool. And now that the mom has passed, because the mom held the family together, the sister, or held her and her sister together, actually, um, the sister has, um, I think, ghosted her is the word, from... Um, you know, adventures, family gatherings, that kind of thing that, mm -hmm. that she just was not included in. And in the name of her, her question to me and, and um, uh, my only answer to her question was she said, I don't know how to approach, how to broach communicating this without making her wrong which would not be showing compassion to her, whatever her issues are. The thing about it is, what's interesting is it's, I think it's a fairly common problem, don't you think? That I do, and that's why I thought you'd be a good mentor for many of us as to how to be honest with somebody who's exhibiting hurtful behavior and to do it elegantly. Well, what I, what I find really challenging in what you say is is uh, the way it's being put by the, by the person that called you. Uh, I want to take action, right? Which is appropriate because she does. She wants to have a, a meaningful relationship with her sister. She also does not want to do a whole lot of other things, right? Make her feel guilty, make her feel under attack, make her this, make her that. Now, the problem with that, if you keep surrounding it with all those conditions, you never act. So what is the compassionate thing to do? I don't really know because I don't know enough about the situation. But if I were to hypothesize, which is only an excuse for trying to think the best you can, you know, physicists do this. They sit around and hypothesize and they have, but they, they have certain rules. But so, so anyway, the thought would be this. Don't confuse compassion with hurting someone's feelings or upsetting someone are making things seem even further apart than they were before. Because we end up narrowing and materializing things like compassion and wisdom by making the results so foremost and so immediate. Our time, our, our sense of time and our expectations about solving something are half the problem. If it seems that the only way to really make any headway is to speak with her frankly, her sister frankly, 
and in such a way that you invite her to respond, but tell her truthfully the problem you see, what, what does it matter if it hurts her feelings? It's at least a response, and it's better than being in no man's land forever. Um, and therefore, out of that hurt and out of the response can come a good, thoughtful response yourself, or herself in this case, so that you begin to build bridges of understanding. But compassion is not pity, and it's not sympathy, just, just sympathy. It can begin in sympathy, but it has to be at some point rooted in knowledge and wisdom, some human understanding. Remember what I said at the beginning? Wisdom, which is, is not my original no notion at all, but I loved it. Wisdom is the discretionary power to do the right thing at the right time in the right moment to the right person. Think of all the rights there. <laughs> Think of how aware you have to be of the other person. Think how much you have to divorce it or separate it from an expectation about time and a particular result. It's not the result. Suppose she never comes back. To, suppose the sister raises this question with her frankly, and it alienates her. Okay, at least that's clean. That's clear. And she still has to hold open her heart to her sister coming back. Or if she feels she could have done something different, she does it. But no action and so overly qualified action is not really going to help very much. Just do common elementary moral sense. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it very much. So I have a lot of thoughts, but I uh, it was very enriching talk. Your last comment, um, wisdom is doing right thing, right time, everything's uh, right, right, right. Yes. So my study of many thinkers and scriptures and the texts and the philosophy, can we ever achieve that goal? I What I see wisdom is a process. It's uh -huh. never that we, now I'm wise, how wonderful I am. That's the problem, you know, because we never can be always right on the right time on the right. Yes, we can through our experiences and self-reflection, all the things you said, God, man, and nature uh -huh. with this. So we can, you know, each moment that we reflect, we can go another step, another step, another step. Maybe we can explain that yeah. maybe. I, I, I think you, you articulate a line of thinking very, very clearly uh, and with uh, articulating it very lucidly. Um, I understand the, the problem. Well, right, right, right. <laughs> that sounds like an awful lot of rights, and that could be self-righteous, too. Um, so it's the wrong kind of righteousness. Uh, I understand that. That's, that makes perfect sense. Um, but we have to be careful because we can slip into a, a kind of simplistic relativism. Oh, no one's ever right? Eh, that's not true. That's not quite right, <laughs> to say it paradoxically. In mathematics, we have the right answer. There's no wrong answer in mathematics. Um, uh, so that is that's a kind of the the rules of it are such that it makes it clear what is right. When we come to human situations, we need simple rules and simple principles, really, as a beginning to awaken the intuition, which is the wisdom to see things in their essence to see things as they really are, and to have a sense of when is the appropriate time to mention something. Uh, let me, let me, I mean, it's like this. Um, the person who has, who has, who's less in a rush to solve a problem, less in a rush to give an answer, uh, has a better sense of timing and a better sense of what would be the most appropriate thing to say or not to say. Take, suppose a young woman goes to her aunt. She's got a problem with a, with a boyfriend. She doesn't want to bring it up to her parents because they'll get all over her about having a boyfriend to begin with, or what's the nature of the relationship and so forth. So it's too sensitive. So she goes to her revered aunt. And she, the revered aunt said, no, no, querida, tell me your problem. What's your problem? You know, feel free, feel free. She knows her aunt is kind and non-judgmental, and so she trusts her, and she tells her what the problem is. 
And of course, she doesn't really at the beginning, but the aunt's perceptive. So she knows how to ask her questions in such a disarming way, in such a natural way, that she feels increasingly at ease to say what really is the problem in her heart, on her mind. And as she does so, and as the aunt is able to bring this more out fully to the consciousness of the young woman, the young woman herself is making discoveries because it's being wisely done. No rush, no rush to give advice. That's the worst thing. She just wants to listen. And she wants to welcome the young woman, wants her to trust not only her, but herself. And she's not in a rush to give her an answer. She's going to say, you know, your problem, that's a very interesting problem. I can understand that. I can see why it's hurtful. I can see why you have concerns and questions. I would have them too. Maybe we should think about this a little more. Why don't you have a cup of tea? You know, <laughs> something. And, and why don't we come back together a little later? I, I, I can only make a couple of suggestions at this point, And then she might make one or two suggestions. But she doesn't rush to do anything. She's patient. Patience is so necessary in the spiritual life and in worldly life as well. Be patient, because don't forget the word patience means suffering. The root of patience is suffering. That's why you have doctors and patients, right? Doctors are to relieve the suffering. And so a wise human being, your wise aunt, can give you very timely advice. And she knows what to specify in your particular world that you would relate to, that you would understand. And you might have further questions from that. And then it becomes a real dialogue. You're working together in concert to understand the problem she has and to see possible solutions. And in the end, the aunt leaves it to her. She has a sense of rightness. What to say, when to say, how to say it. All is important. Does that help? It helped very much. I think your example gave a list of steps that we can cultivate wisdom. First is openness, inviting other for dialogue, deep listening, um, patience. Uh, and then finally, the trust comes in and the dialogue opens up. So I think there are a sort of um, a, a list uh, emerges of how we can cultivate wisdom in our daily life and not quickly jump to conclusions and giving answers. And so I think this beautiful story or example that gave me, you know, just the list of, you know, ingredients, so to speak, one can the cooking. cook wisdom with. <laughs> well, what is also important too here, uh, it's, it's really interesting because, because one of the things of the hallmarks of wisdom that Plato points out a lot is that it's the capacity of a person at a certain point in life to look back, but not for out of regrets and this and that, so much as to sift out from the past what are the lessons that can be learned that are life lessons that are typical, that are common, that are humane, that are human, and then bring that forward into the mind and then use that to help other people. She's distilling. The aunt is distilling. The young woman, when she brings things up, suddenly she remembers her own childhood, her own this, her own that, or something some friend told her, someone, something she read somewhere. She can draw from that and then use that in a golden way to help relieve suffering or to help open the eyes of the young person to a new possibility. But she herself is distilling her past experience and preparing for death, actually. Plato says all philosophy is a preparation for the moment of death. Because you're sifting and seeing, is this wholesome? Is this not wholesome? Is this healthy or is this self-destructive? You start making those distinctions and you're starting to separate yourself from a lot of world illusions and you're able to be a much finer, stronger human being and you're more courageous and fearless. Thank you very much. Sure. Oh, Clifford, Sir Clifford, yes. Jim, that was, that was, that was just so wonderful. I mean, it was a whole banquet of amazing ideas like i saw david shaking his head head afterwards like it's going to explode <laughs> with so, so many great ideas my question is about the idea of reverence for in soul education it seemed like that might be an undercurrent of your whole yeah. talk i mean albert schweitzer spoke about reverence for life and even pythagoras begins his golden verses with reverence 
And it seems like reverence has been uh, an, either a neglected or a trampled upon word in modern modern world, but it seems like it's so essential for soul education, reverence for teachers, reverence for heroes, reverence for nature. If you were going to build an educational system, how would reverence fit into it? Well, that's a fair question. Um, uh, a difficult one, but a fair one. By the way, just as a footnote, I, I don't know the details of it, but I do know that the Dalai Lama has cited different schools now that are attempting to incorporate uh, the kinds of things that the Buddhists feel are important to cultivate in education, which is the cultivation of the quote qualities of the heart and then the importance of values, human values, humane values, universal values, instead of shying away from it. Because what happens is there's such a strange thing that's happened in modern education. Teachers not allowed to mention values. You're, 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 because that's religious. And the Dalai Lama goes right after it. It is no such thing. Values are human. That's part of what it means to be a human being, is you cherish certain things. You give priorities, and you're willing to put your life on the line for them. I don't mean dramatically, but I mean in terms of everyday situations where you must choose what you value and what you find is not good, not helpful, not wholesome. Um, but it begins with, I think, in a deeper sense, uh, this whole notion of reverence. But you can say it's reverence for the divine. But some people have a reverence for nature, which is also something that also is fine because the divine is in nature. So when people go to the Sierras or go to some high mountains in the Alps or in the Andes or whatever, and they're up there and they have this vast vista, which is so expansive, they slough off a lot of their personality for a while. For a while, it's suspended. Their problems become diminished, they become small. They see them more in a much much more encompassing framework, less intense, less personal, able to see with greater clarity. And up there, why? Because they feel a certain reverence for the unspoken, for that which can't be articulated, for that which is just a part of you and a part of everything. And you breathe it and you enjoy it. And for a moment, you're elevated, not only in altitude, but in attitude, so that you have this heart quality that springs up, and you want to bring it back down to the valleys. You want to take it back to the cities. And so some people have to go up into the mountains at times. <laughs> Even if it's your foothills of your city, every city has a little mound somewhere, usually, not all. <laughs> but if you go up into a tower, or go up into the church steeple, you know, <laughs> whatever you might do, uh, find your own place where you can actually do, do what several people do, which is go to a teaching which is resplendent with devotion and the sense of divinity being present, being a vivid, vitalizing presence. It's in the teachings. Teachings are bathed in the divine light when they come from a real enlightened being. They're not ordinary words. You know, every time some simple person, quote, simple person sits down and reads a genuine spiritual text, it's evocative. It brings out the golden idea of reverence, of high regard, of love, admiration, and just it's a, it's a way of nourishing the soul. It brings out the finer qualities in a person. It cleanses the person. So a person who's full of reverence, it multiplies, and it has a multiplying factor in it. Because when you start reverence, whether it's nature or God or heaven forbid man, think about revering man. Look at all the finest examples of human achievement, which is not technological and not success and not money, but human qualities of justice, of courage of acting on behalf of the benefit of people, even though you know you yourself are never going to benefit. Think of all the great heroes and heroines of time. They're worthy of admiration. And when you admire them, it releases some reverence. You're just so grateful to know, as uh, 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 Sri Raghav and I used to mention, you know, there's a poet who said, when you celebrate greatness passing by, you yourself become great. 
it's it's seeing golden qualities in humanity, which goes against the current of public media, which goes against social media usually, which goes against a lot of things. But we have to hold out for that because that's what it's trying to kill out is that notion in the heart that there is something worthy of tremendous devotion and respect, prostration, prostration before the divine. And you're right about, about Pythagoras, too. And also, don't forget, Einstein was talking about his reverence for the mystery of nature was really powerful in him, uh, very powerful. He said, when he had a debate with someone about religion who was a religious person, when he left, he said, well, it was an interesting conversation I had with this person, but frankly, I'm more religious than he is <laughs> because I have an awe before the divine in nature. And as far as I'm concerned, we're like little children in a big library. And every now and then we pick out one book. But the intelligence of everything is vast. But you know, if in terms of practical suggestions, Cliff, if we could ever have, I went to a class once with one of my children was in it. This was when they were in the third grade, fourth grade. I walked into the room. I could not believe what I saw. It was so uplifting. She had quotes on the board from Shelley, from Keats, from Socrates, um, from some other tradition. I don't remember what it was now. And she was talking and she talked about the qualities of these people and why they were to be admired. She wanted the children in a culture which doesn't have myths and doesn't have uh, fables and 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 the kinds of things you had in classical times and still have in India, uh, they didn't have that. So she wanted to nourish the mind with things that were positive because the children would go home to broken families. She wanted something to heal, something for them to feel connected with something because our culture emphasizes separation, competition, and disconnection. And therefore, how can you feel reverence when you feel so isolated and lonely? And as one doctor said, I'm more concerned about the growth of, of depression than I am about any other medical issue, because it becomes the basis for so many other psycho, so many other, not only psychological problems, but physical problems. But when you have someone who idolizes, you know, like we used to idolize the founding fathers, right? Now the realistic historians go and say, yeah, but you didn't know they had this problem, that limitation, this problem, that limitation. Pretty soon, what is there to admire? The fact that someone has a problem or had a limitation or had a prejudice doesn't mean you rule out the whole person. It could be something golden and good in that person. The fact that they had a limitation isn't the problem. If that's all you focus on, how can you respect or revere anything in yourself? Kim, could you just briefly, we are three minutes to the top of the hour, and I know that you need to leave right at four. Yeah. Um, could you say um, something either about stories or about suffering, either one in regard to soul education. Well, I think you, you hit something that's dear to my heart. I think I was just alluded to it just then about fables and, and stories. I think um, stories are vital to a child because a child is naturally trusting and a child loves, I mean, it's, you don't have to convince a child to love a story about heroic, about the heroic, about courage, about love conquering, conquering, you know, hate, about truth conquering, you know, justice conquering injustice. That, that's, that can speak to a child more than conceptual analysis. We do a lot of conceptual analysis, and that's fine. That's good. It has its place. But we don't really celebrate people for their greatness in education. We don't put them out unless we have some particular reason. I remember I was at a conference once and uh, uh, there, were, there were some chemistry professors going on about, woe is me, I, they, this kind of thing. Well, what's, what, do you commit, what, what are you miserable about, I asked. They said, well, because we have to take all these students in general chemistry who have no desire whatsoever to go into chemistry, but if they're in the general sciences, they have to take us. And so that keeps us from the real students. I said, I see your problem. I said, let me ask you a question. Did you ever spend five minutes talking about 
the great achievements in science and what people had to suffer for them to achieve them? Have you ever heard of the people who had the curries and what they did in order to discover radium? Have you ever heard of the people who sweat tears, um, who, were, who were crucified for following science? Or take something from religion, people who are moderate in religion, who were very noble. They're doing, is there any difference between someone who's trying to master something and, and suffers for it, or and someone who's in religion and suffers for it? Why? I said, why not talk about the frontiers of science? You might think it's irrelevant to them, but if you told them your vision of what science could do, what chemistry might be able to do, you might inspire some people to go into chemistry. But as it is, you have such a dour attitude. How can you possibly expect the students to be anything but what you're telling them, what you think they're going to be? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why don't you hold before them stories about great actors and actresses on the stage of science and make parallels with the stage of politics and the stage of religion? These are things that speak to everyone at some level, even students coming in who are freshman students, even, even children. Well, of course, children it does. But it's the lack of holding up before, before the youth and the young of heart and the young of mind, the, the visions or portraits of people who have done extraordinary things in any given field would be welcome in any class. So, David. <laughs> Yes, you blow my mind again, and it's been uh, three years and 11 days since you were with us last. I feel so blessed to have had this time with you today. You, you are such a blessing to this circle, and I, I, uh, I hope it's not another three years before we get to hear from you again. Um, because you shame, you shame me without meaning to shame you, and I appreciate it. <laughs> Pleasure and a delight see you all and to talk to you and I certainly will not be away three years <laughs> so uh, thank you thank you so much Mahalo Nui Lord Tim Hello Mary bye bye <laughs> <laughs>